My name is Gerald. My name is Gabby. But it's not about us today. It's about our mom, Misty Renee Holden. She's the best. She does it all for us. She loves us. She cooks for us. She drives us the games. And even on the weekends, she'll let us stay up. One of mom's favorite shows is Will of Fortune. She always says whatever it is, it can wait until after the show. Actually, I wrote a song about my mom a couple years ago. You want to hear it? Here it go. I love my mother. She's a good mother. She cleans up our room. She gives us this. We have a house. Some people don't. We have a basement, stairs, rooms, and beds. Our mom is the best mommy, yeah. Our mom is the good mommy, yeah. I love watching TV. I love my mom and dad. I think we forgot something. She's totally awesome. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. Love you. Good morning, Alfred Street. Never in a million years would I have imagined myself to be standing here. Pastor Wesley, thank you for inviting me to share my journey to motherhood. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Gerald Jr., Gavin, and Gray's mom. But my real name is Misty Holden. Today I'd like to tell you why I still sometimes don't believe that I am a mom and that this is my life. After barely graduating high school, I didn't have a lot of options. It wasn't because I wasn't smart, I just didn't apply myself. I grew up in a two-parent home until one day at the age of seven, my father suddenly died. I watched as my mother tried her best to manage our lives without him. I saw firsthand the sacrifices she made for my brother and I, and I didn't know if I had the ability to ever do what she so bravely did. I spent most of my teenage years trying to figure it out who I was. I went from job to job. Eventually, I got a job at a factory where my mom was employed. It was a good job, but I didn't want this to be my life. I knew in my heart that God had a bigger plan for me. One day while sitting at work, I realized that there's got to be more for me than this. In 1996, I decided to join the United States Air Force. <laughs> I went to the recruiter's office to get more information about military life. After speaking with the recruiter, he suggested I go to college. <laughs> because I was not Air Force material. <laughs> he implied that since I was full figured, well, in military terms, overweight, <laughs> the military would not be an option for me. I left that office feeling defeated, but more determined than ever. For two years, I worked towards my goal despite missteps and negative comments from people I thought would support me. I didn't give up because I, ha I held on to the scripture, Matthew 19 and 26. With God, all things are possible. In January 1998, I returned to the same recruiter's office and to his surprise, I had lost the weight and was completely eligible to sign up. On April 2nd of that same year, I said goodbye to my family and friends as I began my life in the military. After completing training, I received orders to my first duty station. I was completely shocked to find out that I would be assigned overseas. I had never traveled outside of the United States. My family was convinced that I was moving to China, <laughs> even though my orders were for Okinawa, Japan. <laughs> Y'all, I had absolutely no clue what God or military life had in store for me. 
But the one thing I did know was with God, all things are possible. Sometimes you have to be separated from everything that's familiar so God can do a work in your life. <laughs> After being on the island for two whole weeks, I signed up for a local tour, and that's where I met the Gerald Holden. This was the beginning of my motherhood. Our friendship evolved along with my military career. God was making some stuff happen. We found each other at a perfect time. We married two years later in March of 2000. Military life wasn't always easy. There were deployments, temporary duties, and demanding work hours. We faced our share of challenges, but somewhere around the five-year mark of marriage, we returned to America, Utah to be exact. And my husband wanted to risk it all by having a baby. <laughs> Why would we bring children into our lives at this time? I asked. I wasn't ready to experience what my mother endured. Besides, children are such a huge responsibility. Was I even ready? Could I be a good mom? I asked myself so many questions, and I still do. But when we trust God, he will never leave us. As little girls, we are conditioned to think that first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Misty pushing a baby carriage. <laughs> Then he asked, when are we going to have a baby? We both decided that this was not an ideal time for us, so we waited. Two years later, I was pregnant with our first child. I heard all these stories from expectant mothers about how wonderful their pregnancies were. <laughs> but my experience was not pretty at all. I never get nauseous, but one day I did, and immediately I felt something was up. Gerald tried to help me feel better, but I knew deep inside he was praying he'd become a dad. After a quick drugstore run for a pregnancy test, we followed the instructions and we waited. Just like that, I was pregnant. This was really happening. I was going to be somebody's mother. That day and every day after that, I suffered with a condition called hyperemesis. I had acute morning sickness six to eight times a day, every day, until the baby was born. My husband had one request. Now hear me, he had one request. <laughs> that was to not get sick in his car. <laughs> My morning sickness was so bad that I thought, what in the world have I gotten myself into? And the baby isn't even here yet. Several days before our due date, one night I sensed that something wasn't right. I convinced Gerald to take me to the hospital. We leave the house and blocks away from my front door, I look at my husband and I told him the baby was coming out. <laughs> he calmly responded, you don't know, you have never had a baby. <laughs> but he called 911 and we went to the closest hospital less than two miles away. We turn into the hospital entrance and I calmly turn to him and say, the baby is out. Gerald pulls up to the hospital, comes over to my side of the car, pulls down my sweatpants, and out falls the baby. <laughs> In the front seat of his car. <laughs> he, he asked me not to get sick in his car, and I didn't. <laughs> but God had other plans. The doctors came to the car and completed the labor outside in the parking lot. Thank God there were no complications, 
On the elevator going to our room, that's when we learned we had a son, Gerald Jr. As a working mom, the challenges of motherhood was much more complex. Managing a newborn and everything else wasn't easy. Mothers possess special powers. I mean, they do it all. But what would my superpowers be? Would I be able to give this baby all the love he needs? Could I manage my day-to-day -day responsibilities? I had many questions, but few answers. To complicate matters, Gerald was deployed and I was selected for a temporary duty stateside. I would be separated from my baby. In those moments, the only thing that kept me sane was knowing that with God. If I stayed in relationship with God, I could do anything. A close friend offered to care for him while we were away. God made a way, but it was an extremely low point for me. I had no idea I was dealing with postpartum. I would cry all day, and it, often it was a struggle to get out of bed. I worried about bonding with my son when I returned, but God connected us in many beautiful ways, and eventually I got better. Our family would continue to grow. I got sick in the middle of the day, and immediately I knew I was pregnant. <laughs> in November 2008, we welcomed a second son, Gavin Mose. Now as a mother of two boys, 18 months apart, I continued to struggle finding a rhythm for our family while my husband deployed again. I wasn't sleeping and the, and the demands of the boys was overwhelming while I was still trying to manage my career. I can honestly say I didn't get everything right, but I learned that motherhood wasn't about being perfect. It was about showing up and facing each challenge like my mother did so bravely. My life changed in 2010 when we were selected for a special duty assignment to the White House. What an awesome opportunity to serve our country during this historic period. To see my boys play on the grounds of the South, South Lawn was a sign for reassurance that maybe this motherhood thing wasn't so bad after all. After Gerald retired from the Air Force, he convinced me that we should have one more baby. <laughs> he wanted one more try for a daughter. This time I agreed knowing that I would endure many, many months of sickness. In March of 2016, we welcomed our third and final child. <laughs> well, maybe. A daughter, Gray Renee. I had no idea I would experience this amount of excitement and joy. I worried that I would not have enough love or time to spend with each one of my children, but God has granted me peace to handle each one. I can meet them at all of their needs and even in the middle of the night. I finally discovered my superpower. As a woman, wife, and mother, I am enough. I am enough because God is with me. Even though there were times I doubted myself, God knew exactly what I needed. Nothing in this world gives me more joy than the sound of them calling me mom. I see God in my children often, but especially when Gavin ushers or Gerald Jr. sings, I am filled with gratitude. Motherhood has taught me to be patient and to lead by example because little eyes are always watching. Motherhood is the way by which God stretches me constantly, especially when I step outside of my comfort zone. When I see my kids, I am both humbled and honored that God trusted me to be their mom. In closing, after 20 years of service, I retired from the Air Force 13 days ago. Thank you. I'm looking forward to becoming a full-time mom. I am forever grateful to have had an opportunity 
to share my journey with you. Thank you. Dr. Elaine Kreider, uh, to me, is a uh, loving, trustworthy, loyal, uh, strong woman. She's been like a mother figure to me. I've uh, lost my own mother, father. Uh, I just lost my brother recently here, uh, two years ago, and she's uh, have definitely taken me in and embraced me as her own, as her own son. Um, I'm very grateful to have her in my life. She is caring and thoughtful, and she goes out to find that one person if they're not present, and it shows up in the work that she does, and it's very much so a reflection of her heart, her heart for God and her heart for people. She's direct. Um, she's passionate in what she does and say, and I believe the church will be blessed by what she has to say. Dr. Elaine Kreider is certainly a person who I will never forget, a person who I'm keeping close, and a person who I will continually call uh, my summer mother because of who she's been to me during my internship at Alpha Tree. Dr. Elaine Kreider, I want to wish you a happy Mother's Day, and I love you, all right? passed the first test. I got up here and didn't fall on my face. <laughs> oh, thank you, God. Father, I thank you for bringing me here, Lord. I pray, Lord God, that you open my mouth, Father, and let words come out, Father, that you've given me. I pray, Father, that through the words, Father, it encourages a woman that's here like me. Oh God, I love you, God. I thank you, Father. And Lord, I pray that my life reflects your love. Amen. Amen. <sighs> Pastor Wesley, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to stand here, and Dr. Judy, and all of my staff that are out here somewhere. I thank you guys for just being there with me. I have a story that's probably a little bit different than what you're gonna hear from most people today. I didn't travel the road, typical road of motherhood. And so my story wasn't one that always had gladness and joy and sadness. My story was hurtful and afraid and feeling worthless and useless. You see, I always knew I was gonna be a mother. I knew it from the time I was a little teeny girl playing with these plastic dolls. Those of you that are in my generation know that we didn't have dolls like you have today, right? We had these plastic, hard-faced dolls <laughs> you know, that didn't respond back to you in any kind of way. They just kind of laid there, and we loved them anyway. Those were our babies. And from that time, I took care of babies, and I loved it, and I knew that God was going to give me babies because that was the desire of my heart. Now, I wasn't just going to have babies. I was going to have, are you ready for this? Six boys. <laughs> Six boys. Rough, tumble, hard-headed boys. And I knew that would make my life complete with these six boys. I think at that point, the, the Lord looked down and he said, you know, that girl is a fool. <laughs> I better take care of this some other way. One Sunday, 
in my old church, Matthews Memorial, over in Southeast DC where I grew up, a man came up to me and he said, the Lord gave him a message for me and that the Lord told him to tell me that I was never going to have any children of my own. He said, you're never going to birth any children, but you would be a mother to lots of people older and younger than you. Okay, so I was polite. I'm a nice girl. I did my best eye roll and my best neck. And I said, not to him, behind his back, because I was polite. God ain't tell him that. That wasn't God's message for me. Why? Because I knew that God was going to let me be a mother. That was the desire of my heart. And I knew the Bible said, if I just trust in God, right, I'd get the desires of my heart. If I believed in God, I'd get the desires of my heart. Well, the desires of my heart, my little, I kind of had a little moment there. The desires of my heart were to raise children and to be a mother. Life went on, and summer and fall and winter came one year into the next. A New Year's came, and there were still no, no babies, still no husband, no baby. But I still hadn't given up yet. I believed and I trusted in God. So I'm going to have to try to do the rest of this from memory because my iPad is acting up on me. <laughs> hey, Gerald, this, I mean, uh, uh, Jeff, this wasn't you. <laughs> when you are a woman, you know, it's an ex expectation that you're going to have children. You know, from the day you're born, people talk, start to kind of talk to you about having children. And they, you know, as you get older, they start to look at you like, okay, well, when the baby's coming, you know, uh, uh, Elaine, um, when you gonna give your mama some grandkids? Or, girl, what's wrong with you? You don't have no babies yet? You know, I started to hate to go to family reunions and hated to go to class reunions and hated to do anything where I was going to get asked that question. Don't you have any kids yet? I hated it. And I felt like people need to just leave me alone, right? I wasn't choosing not to have kids. I wanted kids, remember? Six boys. And yet they weren't here. And I got angry. I got mad with God. Let me tell you, I don't think God has seen anybody more mad at him than I was through those years. I couldn't understand what God was doing to me. I had been faithful. I thought I did what God was asking me to do. I came to church. I taught Sunday school. I sang in the choir. I thought I was a good Christian girl, and yet I wasn't having children. What's wrong with this? I wondered what had I done so wrong to God that he would deny me the only thing in my life that I ever wanted. I never want no money, never, never asked for a lot of money. I didn't want big cars, big house. I didn't need any of that. What I did need was some kids. Because to me, those kids would validate that I was worth something, that I had value. And because God denied it to me, it said I wasn't nothing. And I grew up feeling like I wasn't nothing. Every year that passed was another year I felt like I was nothing. And so I kept my anger going for a long time. I still came to church most of the time. And I still sang and did some stuff in the church. But my heart wasn't in it because 
God had disappointed and hurt me so bad. I just couldn't get over that God hadn't done this thing for me. The one thing, the only thing that I ever wanted in my life. And then at one point, I think God said, okay, Elaine, I about had enough of you. So I guess I'm going to have to show you some ways that you do have value. Because even though you haven't had babies, you've influenced a lot of lives out here. He told me, you know, I have eight God children, not just one generation of God children. I got two generations. I don't know why the second one got me, <laughs> but they did, eight of them. I have nieces and nephews. I have mentees, young women, who have asked me if I could help them out, who will come to my house and who want to bring me their babies. So you see, I have a whole bunch of babies that I never had to give birth to. I have heartaches, just like many of you do. I never had a baby. But those godchildren, those nieces and nephews, those kids that I love as if I carried them myself, they break my heart. I have one, some of you know them. I love them to death. And I believe that God knew that my boy was going to need a gami in his life. He knew that he was going to be in trouble a whole lot of times and that Gami was going to stand right there with him. And that helped me to begin to shape, this is my purpose. That there are people out here who don't have a mother, but who need somebody like me that has a heart yeah. that'll take them in. Somebody like me who might be stern with them, but's not going to judge them too tough. Somebody that even when they mess up will give them another chance and another chance and another chance. Somebody that prayed for them, right? Somebody that talked to the Lord about what they were going through. Somebody that would stay on their knees for them. Because that's what this gami is supposed to do. So as I thought about why did God do this to me? Why didn't God let me have my babies that I want? And still, that's the first question I'm going to have to ask him when I get up there. I'm telling you, I'm going to still ask him that question. I've tried to make a little peace with it, <laughs> but it's still something that I'm going to have to know about. I think about some of my folks on my staff. They're not children. They're grown-ups. But let me tell you about a time. I see them in the audience, so I'm going to tell about them. <laughs> and somebody called and asked if I would come over to the office real fast for him. They said, He's really sick and he won't go. And so I got up from my desk and I went in the office and I stood over top of him and I leaned in and I said, get up, go to the hospital. <laughs> and he got up <laughs> and he went to the hospital. And thank God he did, because he was seriously ill. Now, that same hard-headed son of mine was in the office one day, and he needed to go to get a prescription or do something. And he's telling me, it's going to cost me $25, so I'm not going to go. I said, boy, if you lost your mind, he said, I, I, I just can't spend $25 on, on, you know, urgent care. So I'm sorry, 
You know, sometimes I'm not all Christian. <laughs> and I lose my mind a little bit. And I said, well, go on ahead and die then if that's what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> and he went on to urgent care. <laughs> you see, I have a heart of a mother, whether I ever gave birth or not. I know that there are people who need encouragement. I know that there are people who are lost, and sometimes I'm the one that helps to find them. I know as I've lived through all of these years of sadness, let me tell you about the depression. Let me tell you about the nights I cried because I still wasn't gonna be a mother. Let me tell you about the times, I'll just be honest in here, I didn't wanna live anymore because I was worthless. I wasn't a mother. And then, these eight godchildren and this staff and these women that I mentor and these other little ones who are going to come along because I'm going to have some more. They remind me, Elaine, God had a greater purpose for you. That as hard as it was <laughs> to realize, you know, you get to a certain age and you can't deny the truth anymore. Ain't no babies coming up in here. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I guess there could be another miraculous birth. <laughs> but I can't see myself trying to mother a toddler. A two-year-old, I'm gonna leave that to you. <laughs> but I saw now that God's greater purpose was to love all these others out here, those older and younger. So I wanna leave a word. This isn't gonna be for everybody, but this is gonna be for the women who find themselves like me, right? Women who prayed like I did, fasted, stayed on your knees, who trusted that God was going to deliver for you that baby that you wanted so desperately. This is for you to tell you God has a purpose for your life. That purpose may or may not be baby. That purpose may not be kids that you have at 20, but it may be a kid that you get at 60 who's 40 years old and going through a little something, something. God has a role for you to play. And I ask that you learn from me. Don't shut down your life. Don't shut out what God is calling you to do. Don't waste all of those years waiting for that baby to come and ignoring the greater task that God has laid before you. Now, that's not saying, I'm not telling you to give up because one of the things that I hated, you know, was people saying to me about why you don't have a baby and then telling me, well, you know, it's okay if you don't have any kids because if you don't have children, you can serve God better. Well, I wasn't trying to hear that at that time either. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being real with you, right? So I'm not going to sit here and try to tell you that you shouldn't be hurt, that you shouldn't be expectant, that you still shouldn't wish for those babies to come. But I'm also asking you to learn a little bit from me and know
that just because he says no to a baby that you birth, that he saved you from stretch marks, <laughs> <laughs> that he saved you from 19 hours of labor, save the war stories that you can tell, that God is just as proud of you and just as loving of you because you've loved somebody else that he put in your circle. So I thank you for listening to me, putting up with me, recognizing that even though I didn't birth anybody, that I'm still a mother. Why don't you pray with me? God, we thank you for the courage of Misty and Elaine to share with us how they met you in their journey of being a mother. And I pray, Lord, that what you've spoken through them would encourage the hearts of women in this place, those who've birthed and those who are still yet waiting, to realize you are strength and purpose and that they are more than enough. Thank you, O oh God, for what our ears have heard and our hearts have feasted upon in this day. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. As we get ready to go to the table, would you just help me once again thank God for the courage and testimony of Elaine and Misty. Awesome. What an awesome share of testimony and of laughter and encouragement. To see how God has broken a father from being obsessive about his car. God has a sense of humor. <laughs>